I'm gonna show you how to take this little table from this to this. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna take a table that I actually poured epoxy on about five years ago. And I kind of did this as a, um, a test. I put this out on our back porch and put it in full sunlight about 80% of the time. So I wanna show you guys what happens when epoxy is put into direct sunlight for extended periods of time. We don't recommend it. Epoxy is a petroleum based product and just like plastic, when it's exposed to UV for a consistent amount of time, it gets brittle, it gets cloudy, and it can actually crack. So this little table has been in the sun, like I said, for about five years on my back porch. All right, so here's what I want you to notice. So the surface is dull. It's not gloss. This used to be a very high gloss finish. Now, I don't have any cracking. It has really held up well as far as the, the uh, surface not cracking. I've had this, I've had water, you can even see I had a pot plant sitting here and when I would water the pot plant, sometimes that water would go out. So I really abused this table. I did not take care of it intentionally because I wanted to see what would happen. This is where we're starting from. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to sand this down. I'm not gonna sand all the way to the substrate. All I'm gonna do is sand it, get a nice clean surface to start and we're gonna paint it and we're gonna make it look beautiful again. All right, so the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna sand it. Now I've already cleaned it really well with isopropyl alcohol because what I don't wanna do is start sanding on a dirty surface because all that will do is take all that dirt and that grime and push it down into the epoxy as I sand it. So I've cleaned it at this point really well and now I'm gonna come in with a 120 sandpaper and I'm gonna sand it down. All right, so for the edges, I don't want to use my orbital. I'm gonna use uh, just a disc and I'm gonna hand sand it just because I don't want, really wanna burn through all the epoxy and this just makes it easier. All right, so once you've sanded, I'm gonna clean really good with isopropyl alcohol and we'll go to the next step. Okay, so everything's clean. I've wiped everything down with the isopropyl alcohol. Now, if you are going over a piece that already has epoxy, you need to really make sure that all the epoxy on there has good adhesion because you're not gonna wanna pour over the top of any epoxy that's starting to chip or it's starting to peel away. So keep that in mind. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're going to paint with the Stone Coat countertop undercoating. We'll let that sit for about four hours and then we'll go to the next step. Now, if you are using a latex paint, a bare paint, Sherwin-Williams latex paint. You're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna paint it, but you're gonna wanna wait 24 hours because you want that paint to off gas before we pour our epoxy. Okay, I got a pro tip for you guys. We always leave our rollers in the can. That way we don't waste rollers all the time, throw, either throwing them away or trying to rinse them out. And we always know we'll have a roller when we open our can of paint. All right, so I'm using the stone coat countertop undercoating. So I'll do two very thin coats of this. I'll sand lightly with 220 in between coats. I love this product. Very, very, very durable. And it dries, like I said, very quickly. All right, so we're gonna start with part B first. The reason I start with part B, B is less viscous, thinner. I guess you would call it. And so therefore, when I put it in and then I put A, which is more viscous, thicker, it's gonna fall down through B and I'm gonna get a little better, more accurate reading. So here we go. I'm doing three ounces per square foot and I'm gonna be doing actually a little more than 18 ounces, probably maybe an ounce more than I actually need because I'm gonna mix up some accent color and I'm not real sure if I'm gonna use it or not, but I'm gonna have it on standby. It's a one-to-one -one ratio by volume, not by weight. Also, if you put part A in first, it has a tendency to, because it's so thick to stick 
to the edges of your bucket and therefore it makes it a lot harder to mix. We're gonna mix for two minutes. Start up nice and slow and then you can speed up as you go. Now to avoid getting air into my bucket, I wanna make sure that the paddle stays below the surface of the epoxy. If I bring my paddle up, I'm gonna really pull in a bunch of uh, air. All right, so after I've mixed it with the paddle, I'm gonna come in with my uh, stir stick. And actually these are really cool. These are a stir stick trial combo. So it's made so that you can actually get those edges of your bucket. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna scrape our edges and then we're gonna hand stir. What that's doing, it's getting all of that material that's on the side of our bucket that's not fully mixed and it's mixing it into the material. This helps us to not have to change and pour into different buckets, therefore we're saving on material. But it's super important that you mix up that product very, very thoroughly or when you pour it out onto your surface, you'll get sticky spots. So you really wanna make sure that you stir correctly. Now, one way to know if you are stirring your product correctly and long enough is that when you're done pouring your material out, turn your bucket up, wait a couple of days, and then all of that epoxy will pull right out. This has been sitting a couple of days. It's got the epoxy dried or cured, I guess you would call it. It's gonna pull right out. If you consistently get buckets with sticky spots, that's telling you that you're not thoroughly mixing your product. We're gonna start off and I want predominantly this finish to be dark. And so I'm gonna have black dye, black opaque dye from Illumilite, brown opaque dye. Then we're gonna come in with some mica powders, copper, uh, copper metallic powder, dark bronze metallic powder. Those are both uh, products that I sell. Then we're gonna come in with some just resin products. We're gonna come in with the almond, it's a paste. Chestnut, it's also a paste. Just resin bronze. And then for an accent, Thornton Shimmer by Color Passion. All these products are available on my website. Now, if you go to our website and we don't have the Just Resin or the Color Passion products in stock, head on over to artisttilldeath.com. She has over 750 colors. Check out her website and use RK3 coupon code to save yourself a little bit of money. Like I said, my black and my brown are gonna be my predominant colors. So I'm gonna fill those up and I can always adjust as I go. Now the rest of these colors are all going to be about the same amount. So I may decide to adjust at the last minute. We'll see. Now, if you don't have all of these colors, you can substitute very easily with any of the colors that you choose. It's just important that you do have some metallics because that's really what's going to set this piece off. Now, the good thing about these, all I have to do, squirt them down a little bit with isopropyl alcohol and they're ready to go. I don't want quite so much of the copper metallic, so I think I'm gonna add a little more to the bronze and a little bit of this. Yeah, I just want a little bit of that copper. Now, our first is going to be our black. And this is just the black opaque dye from Illumilite. We do sell this on our website. A little bit, guys, goes a long way. Very, very opaque, very highly pigmented. Then our next color is going to be our brown opaque dye. One of my very, very favorite browns. And what I really like about this is that even though it's a brown opaque dye, you can put a very tiny amount and make it transparent, which is what we're gonna do here. We're gonna use both an opaque brown and we're gonna make a little bit up that's transparent because we're gonna add some glitter. So to our opaque cup, for my transparent cup, I just wanna add a tiny little drop. We'll mix that up first. All right, so you see that small little drop 
This is a four ounce cup, so I've got about two ounces in here. Gives me a very transparent brown, and that's what I was going for because I'm gonna put some glitter in here. Now, our other cup, it's going to be an opaque brown. Mmm, I love that. I'm actually gonna make it. No, I think I'm gonna I think I'm gonna leave it. So we're kind of in the middle. We're we're still a translucent. We're not quite opaque yet. And I really, really like that. In fact, I think what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make this a little more. See, this is where this is how I cook, y'all. I just kind of start adding stuff and see what happens. Now that's what I'm talking about. Look at that. Beautiful transparent. So I am gonna add just a hair more here to give myself a really um, opaque brown, almost like an espresso. Oh, there we go. That's what I wanted. All right, so we got our black, our opaque brown, our transparent brown, which I'm gonna add some uh, bronze galaxy glitter, about that much. That's gonna be my bling factor. Oh, wow. That is absolutely gorgeous. Isn't that pretty? Okay, next we're gonna be doing our dark bronze mica powder. Now, usually when I mix a mica powder into epoxy, I do my mica powder and I make a slurry out of our thin dispersion, but I'm making a very, very small amount. Um, so I'll be able to mix that really well. What happens is if you don't mix your uh, mica powders thoroughly, when you put it on your surface, you'll get these little fishtails or starburst because your mica powder hasn't been uh, thoroughly mixed. So that's why we use the dispersion fluid to help it uh, mix really, really smoothly. All right, so I got my dark bronze mica powder. And we're gonna come in with our copper mica powder. Now that copper is really gonna give me a little bit of that rustic look that I'm going for. Cause this is gonna be actually my table guys. I very seldom do anything for myself, but this is going to go on my porch. And I love copper and I love turquoise. I even had someone comment on my last video that they don't think I'm capable of making a finish that doesn't have blue in it. And I have to agree, it is very hard for me to do that. All right, so this is our almond from Just Resin. This is a paste. Now, this can be used interchangeably. If you don't have almond, I would say our uh, bronze mica, mica powder is very, very close to our almond. So if you don't have the Just Resin product, you can use a bronze mica. So we have our chestnut mixed up, very, very deep brown, really pretty. And then we'll come in with our Just Resin bronze. Now our bronze is very metallic and our bronze is going to react a little bit different. It's almost gonna float. So the reason I'm using this is it just gives us one more layer of interest and it's gonna look really cool. All right. Now comes the secret sauce. Love, love this color. Very, very rich. It's by Color Passion. It's called Thornton Shimmer and it does shimmer. Beautiful turquoise, deep, deep, deep turquoise color. By using different mediums, by using dyes, powders, paste, when we put them all on the surface together, they're gonna be kind of fighting each other and we're gonna get some really cool effects. All right, so our surface is dry. We did two coats of the black undercoating from Stone Coat Countertop, slightly sanding in between coats, and it's dried for four hours and we're ready to go. All right, so I'm excited. I'm gonna start with my black. Like I said, I want this to predominantly be a dark color. So I'm just gonna start putting my black out and I'm just 
very random of where I put it. Now I'm not gonna push it all the way to my edges right now. I'm gonna use my hand in just a minute and get that product all the way to the edge. All right, so that was my black. This is my opaque brown. And I'm gonna do the same thing. Now on video, you guys are not gonna be able to differentiate between the black and the brown. But in real life, when the sun hits it or the light hits it just right, there's so much depth by using the brown and the black together. All right, now I'm gonna just start bringing in my darker colors. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna kinda of have my colors a little concentrated in some areas and then real light in other areas. Just kinda of turn those upside down so I can get all that color out. All right, so before I add my metallic bronze, I'm going to kind of take my hand and meld this just a bit so I can kind of get an idea of what I'm looking at. Oh, there, that's what I wanted. Now I'll push it to the edge, but I'm not gonna push it quite over the edge yet. I'm gonna have plenty of material, so I'm not really worried about that quite yet. All right, so now I kind of see where my colors are. Now I can come in with my bronze and I could be real selective, kind of where I want to put that bronze. Still have a little bit in my cup. Again, I'm gonna take my hand. And when you use your hand, don't press hard. You just want to use very light touch. So you're just dragging and using your fingers almost as a decorating tool so that it can just drag that material and not really move it off your substrate, but just cause some really pretty designs. I really like using my hands because I can feel if I've got any uh, particles in my finish. I can also feel when it's really thick in some areas. Maybe pick up some of this, bring it over here. Now I'm gonna start working on my edges, bring that down. Now I'm also going to be, as I bring it over the edge, I'm going to be bringing my hand underneath and rubbing so that I help that epoxy roll and not form a lip right on the edge. Epoxy likes to go where epoxy's already been. So by putting epoxy underneath that ledge, it's going to help it roll over. Any surface tension I have, I'll just tap it. Now I don't wanna put a lot of heat on my edges because on this surface, the thinnest part, meaning where I have the least amount of, of epoxy is going to be on my edges because as the epoxy rolls over, because it's a fluid material and it's trying to self-level, it's gonna roll over and be very, very thin on my edges. So I don't wanna to add too much heat because that's gonna make it more fluid and it's gonna run. Now I have one more, actually two more. I have one more brown and then I have my uh, Thornton Shimmer. But this is the translucent brown where I've added my glitter. So I'm gonna come in there and add some striations of this. Again, I'm just kind of being random. You don't wanna get patterned so that it looks like a, a, a zebra. You wanna make sure it's very random. And depending on how much bling you want, you may not want to do this at all, or you want to may you may want to put a little more than I'm putting. Again, I'm going to take my hand very lightly, kind of drag my fingers. My fingers are barely touching the surface, just kind of causing it to mix a little bit. Now, if you want your veins of glitter to stay very distinct and stay in a very very distinct line. You're going to want to wait to put your glitter on the surface for about 20, maybe even 30 minutes, depending on where you live, what your temperature is. That way, the surface is starting to gel up. And then when you put that glitter down on top, it's going to stay tight. I know that my glitter is going to sink a little bit and that's okay because it's going to make it very soft. So guys, I know it's really hard for you to see all of the detail, 
because epoxy is very hard to film. But here in just a minute, we're gonna turn our lights off and then we're gonna put spotlights on here and show you up close what we're doing. All right, guys, I love this, but I am gonna add a little bit of my Thornton shimmer. And the reason is because this is the color of the door and the pillows on my porch. So <laughs> I wanna bring all of that in to this piece. So we're not gonna add a lot, just gonna be a hint. Now, before I put a lot, I'm gonna take my hand and I'm just gonna very lightly touch it. Yeah, I like that. And I'll tell you what I'm gonna do, instead of using my fingers this time, I'm actually gonna take a Bondo spreader and I'm gonna start moving it around a little bit and I'm gonna put that blue, kind of push it in so it's a little, has a little bit different design in it. So as I'm using this Bondo spreader, I'm kind of pushing it down and twisting it at the same time. I really like how that makes it have a really pretty pattern. In fact, I'm gonna take this Bondo spreader and kind of come over where I've done the striations because now we've been on the table for about 20 minutes. So my epoxy starting to kind of thicken up a little bit. And by taking this Bondo spreader and moving it, I'm really getting some neat designs because I'm waking up that mica powder again and bringing in all those layers. All right, so it's actually been two days since I finished the color coat. I got real busy, didn't have time to come back and do the flood coat immediately. So as a safety precaution, I'm going to clean the surface with isopropyl alcohol before I start to sand. And the reason I'm gonna do that is it's been in my shop. I have some dust. I may have touched it. Oils that have gotten on my, um, from my fingers have gotten on the surface. So I wanna clean all of that off really well before I start to sand. Because if I don't, then I'm gonna take all that grime and push it down into my sanding pattern. And I don't wanna do that. So first of all, I'll clean it. Just 91% isopropyl alcohol. Now I'll sand it. All right, I'm gonna come in with a 220 grit and I'm just gonna sand the surface. I don't wanna sand my edges. I'm gonna do that by hand, just so I'm really careful not to sand through the color coat down to my substrate. All right, so when you sand your edges, you wanna make sure that you don't do it with a power tool. You'll really have a chance of burning through your edges. I like to take the sanding disc off, use it by my hand, or we also have these sanding pads available on our website. All right, so I'm just gonna come in, go around the edge, and all I'm really trying to do is take off that gloss. You don't have to get as aggressive as I did. Um, I just had a few imperfections that I wanted to take care of, and that's why I used the orbital sander. You definitely don't have to do that, but you do want to take off that gloss so that the flood coat will have a tooth to bite onto. All right, I'll take all the dust off. I'll clean it again with isopropyl alcohol, and we'll be ready for the flood coat. So I get a lot of questions um, from people who have sanded their color coat and then they're worried because now it's dull and you can actually see sanding patterns and they're worried that those scratches are going to uh, be able to be seen up through your flood coat. I promise you, as soon as you put that epoxy down for your flood coat, all those scratches are gonna go away. All right, so I am not a mathematician. And I get questions all the time, especially in class. How do I figure up the square foot of a round table? So this is how I do it. Hey Siri, what's the square foot of a circle with a 32 inch diameter? Okay, I found this on the web for what's the square foot of a circle with a 32 inch diameter. Check it out. All right, so she's telling me that a 32 inch circle has a square foot of 5.5. So I'm going to boost it to six 
square feet, multiply that by three because I'm gonna do three ounces per square foot. All right, let me go mix up my epoxy and I'll be right back. All right, so I mixed up 18 ounces of the Stone Coat Countertop Regular Epoxy and I've added a little bling, a tiny, tiny bit of Bronze Galaxy Fine Dust. You don't wanna put anything really heavy and you don't wanna put a lot because I don't want that to take over my clear flood coat. So I just put a little bit. Now I use my hands a lot, but I really love this little trial here. It lays everything out an eighth of an inch. All right, I'm pushing it right up to the edge, but I'm not really pushing it over my edge quite yet. Now I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna push that epoxy right over the edge. And again, I'm gonna roll my fingers under that edge so that it really does kind of seal my edges. And when I sand off those drips, I'm not gonna have any area of my edges that aren't fully covered. Now you notice I didn't chop because I'm using my hand. A lot of the videos that you see, we may chop after we trial, but if you use your hand, you're fine. All right, level everything out. One reason I like to use my hand is as I run my hand over the surface, I can make sure I don't have any debris and I'm guaranteed not to get a brush hair. All right, this is so pretty. All right, I also get a lot of questions asking me, is it necessary for me to put a flood coat over my color coat? Technically, you do not have to do that, um, especially if it's going to be a piece that's not a high traffic piece, a little end table or something that you're really not gonna have a lot of traffic and you're gonna be using the ultimate top coat. The reason I love to flood my pieces is one, it gives that extra durability. It also brings back the uh, characteristics of what the epoxy was actually developed to do. There's no additives, there's no color additives in there, there's no uh, spray paints, all of which kind of, um, I guess, uh, compromise the integrity of the epoxy a little bit. So if I have spray paint in my design, I don't really wanna use it as uh, a surface where I'm gonna have food. Doing a clear flood coat is gonna bring that back up to your food safety, your high heat ratings, your high scratch resistance, and all of that. Now, after this, I'm gonna let this flood coat sit for 24 hours, and then we're gonna go do the ultimate top coat. If you want to see how we do the ultimate top coat, uh, we do have videos that are very, very detailed, and I highly suggest that you watch those before you attempt to do an ultimate top coat. It's a very easy process, but there are learning curves and there are very important ratios that you guys need to use. Hit me up if you need the PDF that I came up with that shows all the ratios for my, uh, for my ultimate top coat. Uh, you can also go to my website, RK3Designs, go under the shopping page and right under the word shop, there are a, there's a link and it says ultimate top coat instructions. All right, so let's get going on this blood coat. Now that I've got it laid out, I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna torch it three times. I'll wait, I don't know, three to five minutes and I'll torch it again. Then I'm gonna turn off any airflow that I, I may have in the building. I don't want to get ripples. And also I'm gonna turn my lights off because bugs love to see themselves in the reflection and dive bomb. Uh, I'm not really worried about dust bunnies. And the reason is because I know I'm going to put the ultimate top coat which means I'll be sanding this surface and any dust that lands on this surface, I'll be able to sand them right out and then roll on the ultimate top coat. All right, guys, what do you think? I think it turned out awesome. Now, here is the question I have for you. Would you like to see part two of this video where I actually paint the base of this table? I'm not real sure what color I wanna do it, I'm gonna do a little bit of that faux finishing on there. So if you would like to see that, let me know in the comments and we will have part two to this video. If you like this video, guys, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell for future notifications. That way you know every time we post a video. 
Also, all of these products that we use are available on our website, rk3designs.com, and a list of all of those products will be in the description of this video. All right, guys, you know the routine. Don't be scared, move forward, and always be creative. Till next week, I love y'all, bye.